little bit of a tweak in the title. I mean, we had to, initially there was even a mis bit of a misunderstanding, I think, about what I was going to talk about. Yeah. And I, it might have been advertised as um, evaluation of uh, uh, doctoral studies in design. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. <clears throat> well, this isn't entirely unconnected to that. It's perhaps just a slightly broader version. And this represents what I'm currently working on and looking at, uh, I guess, the theory of evaluation, although theory of evaluation is actually a thing, which I've only recently discovered, and um, it, it doesn't exactly map on. So what I, what I want to talk about really is um, how we have evaluated uh, artistic research in the past and perhaps it, what it says about uh, our view of what artistic research is. And by artistic research, I mean this thing that's got lots of different labels, uh, practice-based research, practice-led research, all of that kind of thing. And I've chosen artistic research because that's what it's called in some European environments. And at the moment, I'm doing some work with the Belgian Research Council, and that's what they call it. But basically, it's focusing on research that involves a creative practice of some kind. Now that might be art, like fine art, it might be design, it might be music, it might be architecture, but in any of those disciplines, focusing on the creative, uh, maybe aesthetic side, as a, in contrast with uh, possible studies in the history of this subject or the technology of this subject. So that's really, I think it's quite a nice name for that because it doesn't claim too much. Um, and it's open to interpretation. And I put it in brackets because really what I, my interest in artistic research is always in comparison with other kinds of research. So does the emergence of something called artistic research reveal anything about our assumptions or understandings of what research is in other areas? And also I'm interested in developing claims for artistic research um, in relation to the claims for research in other areas. So that enables, if, if you can do that, that enables a conversation in an environment like a university where often one's in um, interdisciplinary situations, committee meetings and so on, where it's no good making claims that are unique to artistic research and not recognisable by anybody else. So having some language that bridges that gap, even if what you're claiming is that artistic research is something completely novel and new. It might be like postmodernism. you know, you kind of explain it in relation to modernism and people can get a handle on it. Otherwise, you can't really have any discussion about it at all. And I'm rather resistant to claims for the novelty of artistic research being so great that it's incomparable to other forms of research and perhaps even inexpressible in words and you kind of have to be an artist to understand it or you have to be a research an artistic researcher to understand it this all um, limits or even prevents discussion and again that's not helpful in the kind of environments where I'm working uh, and just to uh, kind of reveal the, the structure of what I'm doing, I'm, I'm going to contrast a little bit the, uh, how it was more or less in the 90s when the key question um, as a result of art schools m moving into universities and so on was the question um, for any given case, is it a case of research? So is this research? What is art-based research, practice-based research, artistic research? And I think that's been replaced partly by REF in this country, partly by increasing confidence in the various centres that are, that are doing this, replacing this ontological question, is it research, with another question, which is, is it good research? And I like that change, because you can only go so far with the first question, and the second question invites different kinds of approaches. So I'm going to kind of talk about it in those two ways. Okay, so I've got, my interest is in research, but I think it, the part of research that I'm interested in is the, the capacity of research to generate uh, new knowledge. 
So the new part is interesting to me. And so it's not unrelated to the general activity that we do at all levels in the school to do with creativity. We're in the position of evaluating creative outputs. And so we're confronted with a general question at all levels in an institution like this, at a school like this, which is how does one evaluate something that is genuinely new or original or novel or unprecedented, you know, whatever words you want to put on this that help you kind of get hold of the, the general problem. So it's not a problem that's limited to research and it's the, the problem becomes a research problem um, because it's related to the claim for new knowledge. So traditionally, I think we see research as a building activity. So you've got existing knowledge, you've got all your bibliographic references, your citations, your contextualization of what you do, and then you add a little something to it. And if you think about the big pyramid of, of conceptual blocks that underpin the one little block you put on the top, the majority of this is known already. And so the contribution, the novel contribution is relatively small. But nonetheless, the claim is that that is new. So there's a limit to how much this pyramid is going to help you evaluate the, the, the new part. And actually, if you're a, um, an assessor for something like a, a PhD, the key claim, one, one of the key claims, is that this is an original contribution to knowledge. So a very important part of this last little brick is that it isn't one of the existing bricks that we've got, it's something new, and, we, and we've got to kind of deal with that. So it changes the emphasis of the, the problem. And um, I found uh, two authorities, the unlikely named yeah. Stuffel Beam and Schinkfield, a great combination, uh, who wrote a key text uh, on evaluation. And one of the things they say is that the most, one of the most prominent definitions states that evaluation uh, means determining whether objectives have been achieved. And that was pretty much where I started. I thought that you evaluate your success or failure at something according to whether you've achieved the objectives that you set out to do. Not an entirely unreasonable claim, I think. So in our case, um, I think what we've got is um, some kind of uh, initially unexplained relationship between art on the one hand and research on the other. And by combining them in some way, we establish a field called artistic research. And the, although the name implies this relationship, it doesn't really tell us anything very much ab about what, re what that relationship is. So is artistic <coughs> research a lot like art and a little bit like research? Is it a lot like research and a little bit like art? Is it dramatically new? So, so art and research have got together and given birth to some, something completely kind of unrecognizable from its parents. So we're not in entirely helped by the knowledge that it lies somewhere between art and research. And in particular, I think we, we don't know whether it's research that's been artified, made more arty. So there, there are manifestations of uh, artistic research that take that approach. So Knowles and Cole published a large book called um, uh, The Arts in Qualitative Research, a handbook of the arts in qualitative research. Very interesting book, but when they describe uh, the activity, they describe art being at the service of qualitative research and principally social sciences. In other words, something like visual representation of data, um, visual communication of complex data sets and conceptualization and understanding and so on. So using uh, artistic visual design skills to help qualitative researchers, social sciences let's say, social scientists, uh, to, to either gather or principally to present or represent their data. So that would be um, artified um, research. Or we might do researchified art, which is something you, you come across quite a lot in conferences where you 
hear people attaching scientific or philosophical concepts to the studio work that they are doing. And I recently reviewed um, a book called, um, gosh, what was it called? Experimental Systems, um, and it had a subtitle, but basically it was a set of essays by artists who had found the scientific writings of Hans-Jörg Reinberger, uh, who is a, a philosopher of science, found his writings very interesting and relevant for what they are doing in art. And Reinberger has a kind of broad philosophical understanding of what it is to undertake experiments, for example, to think in scientific ways and, un and undertake in certain investigations. And they were mapping this onto their art practice. And that seems to me to be um, a researchified art, if you like. So I'm talking about possible relationships that, that exist here. And one of the um, consequences of this hybridization um, was that the various research councils needed to make claims for what they, they thought artistic research would be, because they were funding it. And this is the definition that you're probably all very familiar with from AHRC, that is more or less unchanged, I think, since, <coughs> well, even AHRB, its predecessor, 1998, I think this was written. Um, but certainly it was kind of reauthorized 10 years ago, 2004, 2005, when the board became a council. And the, what I want to draw your attention to here, and perhaps I should read it first, it says, creative output can be produced or practice undertaken as an integral part of the research process, as defined above. The council would expect, however, this practice to be accompanied by some form of documentation of the research process, as well as some form of textual analysis or explanation to support its position and as a record of your critical reflection. Equally, on the other hand, creativity or practice may involve no such practice at all, in which case it would be ineligible for funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So what struck me here was, first of all, they have got an expectation. They've got a model of what artistic research is, and they're going to fund you according to whether your proposal conforms to their model. And their model includes this kind of thing, uh, basically a process, because they say creativity or practice may involve no such process, in which case they're not going to fund it. So it has to include a process of this kind. And I, in the past, I've called this a process-based model, but it also belongs to a criterion-based model in which you say research has got certain characteristics. And the HRC are saying that research has got uh, characteristics based on its process. And this is very common. It belongs to the sort of early uh, definitions, um, and it focuses attention on achieving certain things that I'm going to call uh, tick boxes. That was their punchline. So there are, um, there are other, way, other areas where we find similar manifestations. Um, this, uh, this is a rather long list that doesn't all fit on. Um, these are the research degree regulations from King's College London, where uh, in December I did PhD examination. And this can also be seen in part as a, a checklist. So amongst the things that they require are uh, there's a word count, bibliography and references, uh, even, I think, to some extent, that you demonstrate certain research skills. There's a list here of things that a non-specialist <coughs> could evaluate. They could go through the thesis, that, has it got this? If so, all right. If not, reject. And some research councils have a process like that, where an administrator goes through a proposal, and if you haven't done certain things, it doesn't even get to the next stage. It doesn't go out to reviewers. And this is a, a quantitative um, uh, response to the, the problem of what constitutes research or artistic research. 
Now, in the case of the, the um, thesis that I was examining, this isn't the thesis, but this was a thesis that provided a, a precedent for the, the one that I had. This was in, I think it's 2005, not very important. This is a thesis from British Columbia. It's been published as a book, but the contents are a novel. Now, this is not a PhD in creative writing. I could have waved another example that was a PhD in creative writing that was a novel. But this is a PhD in education. And the content of the research is presented in the form of a novel. There is, admittedly, a kind of prefacing comment and a post-facing comment. But basically, it's a novel, as was the one that I was presented with. And these elements of the um, evaluation process seem to be very arbitrary in, in this case. Um, there was, uh, I was told about a, a case in, in Sweden where the, um, the candidate had put forward um, an account of a seminar discussion, all of which was entirely fictional. And so the references were fictional as well. And the examiners regarded this as lying and failed the candidate, uh, rather than regarding it as you know, creative practice um, and doing something with that. So it, this quantitative approach, this tick box thing, only gets you so far in um, evaluating research and what is research. There's even part of the REF definition that has got this quality about it, ignoring the second part, which is terribly good, the first part in green, is a process of investigation. So it's emphasising there's a process. And they've probably got something to say about this process, and certainly universities would have uh, things to say in the spirit of AHRC about what kind of process leads to research and what kind of process doesn't lead to research. And I think what, what is being attempted here is to define research as a process independent of the thing that's being researched. So these are generic definitions. REF applies to every subject under the sun. You know, the medical uh, researchers, social scientists, physicists, artists are all subject to the same regulatory uh, and evaluative structures. But I'm not sure that, certainly in our um, field, and maybe in other fields the, the feeling is much the same, that we're very hung up on the process. I mean, ignoring for the moment the, this research label, certainly in the professional practice of art, I think we don't have anything against people or outcomes as, that are the result of inspiration, uh, of chance, of the outcome of a dream. Yeah. We, we don't censure that kind of outcome. And if that work becomes influential and, and alters the progress of, of our discipline and, and perhaps becomes a canonical work, but has at its root a happy accident, I mean, there are works explicitly about using chance. So, it, it, we don't require that there is some systematic process, although maybe if we want to claim it as research, we have to systematise it, or we would choose to reject work of that nature, of that sort of random or chance nature, non-systematic nature. So I think there are consequences for accepting this kind of approach that we may or may not feel comfortable with according to the consequences. We may find certain things are ruled out. And just to um, uh, reinforce that that is not just uh, what artists feel about these, these things, um, where perhaps art is a different field and perhaps art shouldn't even be included in the research definition, um, this was my favourite book at the moment, um, David Bloor, Knowledge and Social Imagery. Bloor is a, a critic of... Um, uh, social sciences and technology, 
and a bit like Latour, he critiques the scientific process and shows it to be based largely on you know, personal preferences, dreams, luck, and all the things I've just been talking about. So, so he's making claims, even in fields of mathematics, um, that uh, this is not uh, objective, systematic, and conforming to all of these sorts of criteria, uh, generic criteria that, that um, are held up as definitive uh, and characteristic of a research process. And finally, just to put my own ten penneth in, uh, I mentioned that I'd reviewed a book, and one of my criticisms of this book um, was that it assumed that in order to take an artistic uh, practice and researchify it, there were a number of processes that you would need to go through, uh, amongst which were, or transformations I called them, sorry, not processes, uh, an academicization of language, so you choose a certain voice to talk about the work, the establishment of an explicit relationship to a philosophical system, or there might be a scientific system, but you know you, you relate it to something that has got academic credibility, um, uh, and uh, you seek the authorization of science to legitimize artistic methods, none of which transformations I regard as being necessities. I don't think that's the way forward for identifying art artistic research. So then we so come, come back to this question. And actually, I cheated a bit because uh, Stuffelbeam and Schinkfield don't like this definition at all. They think it's inaccurate, uh, in, inadequate, sorry, inadequate. And they prefer one that comes from a USA organization, which is that evaluation is the systematic assessment of the worth or merit of an object. And I think that's much more productive and actually in line with what may simply be an historical shift where uh, in the last 10 years or so, I think we have been much more interested in the value or worth of, of research, moving to this question, is it good research, rather than being stuck with the ontological question of, is it research at all? In which case, what are the characteristics that we're looking for? Um, and a, a couple of things that, that um, Stuffelbeam and Schinkfield raise as objections to the former definition is, first of all, if your objectives are rather modest or even weak, then achieving them doesn't really do anything. You might have 100% success in achieving them, but in, uh, you're achieving something that isn't worthwhile. And also, if you are um, restricted to determining whether you've achieved your objectives, you can only determine that at the end. And AHRC, for example, require researchers to report on outcomes for many years. I think it's about six years after the end of a project. Is that something like that, isn't it, Grace? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but they, so they expect that, that a project doesn't come to an end when the funding ends, that, that it goes on, perhaps even goes on beyond that. So we would have to suspend evaluation until after that time. And, you know, clearly that's not very adequate either. Uh, so this, this tick box mentality doesn't, doesn't do us much of a service. Um, and I think it also focuses attention on the, um, uh, the intention of the researcher to do something original rather than the effect and the consequence of the work. So some work, particularly in, in creative arts, becomes influential, is received in a particular way, is received as research almost regardless of the, of the uh, intention of the, the artist. So merely intending to make influential work doesn't necessarily make it influential, and perhaps something is influential even when the intention was something else, or perhaps the, the outcome is influential towards a particular um, uh, change that was not the change that was originally in, envisaged and so on. And I think as a discipline we're kind of happy with that. So the, uh, the merit of an object, taking the word object loosely at the moment, the merit of, of the object is the, the impact it's going to have, the, the potential for change, the influence on other researchers, and so on. 
and the worth of the object is the cost benefit. So the worth of something may be poor if the cost is very high. The impact might be high, but the cost might be even higher. And then you might think that the worth of the object, the outcome is rather low. So those two things are differentiated, which I think is also important to come on to that. So what's happened, I think, is that we've replaced uh, an ontological question, which is largely quantitative, with an epistemological question, which is largely qualitative. And I think the second question invites a different approach as well. It actually invites a bottom-up approach rather than top-down. So the, the uh, what is artistic research, we have to go back to fundamental principles, something like that. But what is good artistic research invites us to look at the community, how they're using it, society, what's going on here, what, what is impactful and what is not impactful. And in creative arts, I think we've got a number of different uh, areas where we could look for that. Um, and we could look at art objects, so we've got artifacts coming out uh, uh, from studios. I think we've got artists themselves, because we have a theory of uh, artistic production which is authorial. So um, uh, once we have legitimised Damien Hirst as an artist, anything that Damien Hirst does is art, is the authorial theory of art, um, which is a way of accommodating what is new. We don't have to constantly ask ourselves what is art if we've adopted that policy. And we have got... Um, uh, contexts for uh, artistic uh, display and uh, artistic impact. So we have works that are notorious in one way or infamous in one way or another that have to be put behind bulletproof screens. And this isn't necessarily to do with them being toxic or being super valuable, uh, unless you think that political toxicity uh, is, is one of the factors that needs to be, we need to protect against. So we've got um, a, uh, a reception aesthetics that I think I've mentioned already, um, a reception aesthetic in which we receive certain work in certain ways. It starts to have a societal role or it has a, a field-specific role. So we have the canons of art with, within, our, within our field where we think these are particularly influential works and we've also got a, a societal impact and some works influential and some works are not thinking about uh, the outcomes of artistic practice being influential. So we might differentiate between what you could call intrinsic qualities and extrinsic qualities. So, I um, mean, this is not Alberti, this is Roger van der Weyden, but the first image is, uh, uh, bears some resemblance. We could, we could discuss it in Alberti's terms of what makes good art. So there's composition, there's abundance, there's depth, there's various, he has certain keywords, certain characteristics, a bit like the, the um, criterion-based definitions at the beginning. And there are extrinsic factors about how something like Guernica is, is received and used societally. You know, this perhaps is a hot potato, uh, whether or not it's a valuable or great artwork. And I believe, actually, that uh, all um, topic areas, all, all fields, have got both intrinsic and extrinsic um, uh, elements that have potential for impact. So research in, in general, this doesn't characterise something about artistic research, research in general has got uh, uh, this potential for impact. And I think we need to focus on fitness for purpose. So what is the, the purpose of this? Not just the purpose within the field, but perhaps societally as well. What do we think uh, researchers are doing? And therefore, if we transpose this into the field of art, what do we think artistic researchers are doing? what would make us think that something was good. <coughs> I think if we stick to intrinsic qualities, that the, the, belongs to that former question, the, the first question, the rather old-fashioned question, focuses our attention on um, uh, 
criteria that are not related to the value and the merit that we find in a work, um, but rather some sort of physical or process-based characteristics, such as we saw in the AHRC definition. And in um, uh, evaluation theory, this is called an implementation theory. And those are of limited use. I think more constructive, if we're thinking about how we would evaluate artistic research, is to look at those extrinsic, uh, subjective in the sense of the philosophical subject and societal impacts, and particularly this thing about merit versus worth. And then I started to think, well, is that, is that something to do with the impact agenda? So um, we're interested in impact and influence, talking about it generally. Does the work have impact? Does it reach an audience? Uh, we've also got REF with a particular impact agenda. I'll say something about that in a moment, finish up with that. But just to note that the process of peer review in journals focuses very much on the merit or value of a, of a work. And what peer review seeks to do is to identify that something is new and original, our original question, um, and is going to have impact within the academic community, the, the community of users. So merit is measured by the merit to whoever is going to use that research. Principally, it's going to be the academic community or the specialist community. They don't have to be academic. But it's not really focusing on wider societal impact, societal impact, although there may be some. What did I have written up in here? Yes, so the, the second part of the REF definition that I... Um, that I put up earlier, I've initially highlighted the process of investigation and said, well, that was um, uh, to do with characteristics and criteria. The second part is more promising and belongs to our more modern question about what makes something good research, and that is that it leads to new insights effectively shared. And that's having a, some kind of impact in the user group. But REF has also added this second part um, about impact defined as the effect on or change or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services, health, the environment or quality of life beyond academia. And what I'm now clearer about, and perhaps you were clear about all the time, and I'm just a slow learner on these things, is that the second comment is actually a comment about worth and not about merit or value. The reason we're interested, I think, in the second one, this impact beyond academia, is that it gives, gives extra cost benefit. So this is a question of interest to stakeholders, such as taxpayers, where having invested in the research, if we can get more spin-off benefits out of it, more widely than just the narrow academic community, we're getting more bangs per buck, and therefore it increases the worth of the research. I don't think it increases the merit or value of the research because the value of the research is its potential to move something forward in the field. So my last slide is that evaluation is undertaken in a political environment. So the, both quotes here are from the Sage Handbook of Qualitative Research in a, a chapter about evaluation. Uh, and they caught my attention. One is politics and science are both integral to evaluation. So you can't set up an evaluative procedure without evoking some either societal view, perhaps a stakeholder view like REF and its impact agenda, uh, or a, a scientific one about how you would uh, measure the, the value of a contribution to a field, and such, such as is critiqued here by Bloor. And 
the second one, whose questions are addressed and which values are promoted. So an evaluative structure always um, uh, prefers some qualities uh, to others and thereby rewards certain activities, as REF does do. And uh, REF, thinking about the impact agenda, has got quite a high focus on value for money for the taxpayer, and bangs per buck, uh, and has only got part of its agenda, still the majority, but not entirely, the advancement of the field, which um, at surface, uh, via sort of superficial view of the objectives of REF, you might think, well, the, the objective of REF is principally to ensure that um, the research that's going on is advancing the field, is advancing knowledge. But that's undermined by something like the impact agenda. And that's it. That's all I've got to say about evaluation.